you, you reckon I can run fast? You want to hear me yell? Right. <laughs> With the stunt only seconds away, petrol is poured into the mortars that contain the explosives. This is done last to prevent evaporation. Now the car is ready to roll, with the driver replaced by a dummy. Gary had just received a consignment of new equipment from the States and Grant offered to help him test it out. Shut the eye. The breakaway glass was up to standard. It's made from melted resin and shatters with blunt edges. But the bullet-ridden body stunt gave the unsuspecting camera crew a few anxious moments. Thank you, buddy. I'm right. Well, we can all make mistakes. All right. Don't worry. Thanks, Gary. Great, man. Such scenes require sacks of makeup blood, wired to small explosive charges to be concealed inside the actor's costume and detonated electrically. It's quite hygienic, you know. <laughs> Actually, uh, 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 it tastes like honey. No, thanks. <laughs> Not really. before dinner. Not before dinner. <laughs> then Gary and his team unloaded the equipment necessary for an effect hitherto untried. For a forthcoming war film, Special Effects Unlimited had to simulate heavy loads of napalm dropped from the air. To use real napalm in the battle scenes would be expensive and dangerous. So Gary devised the idea of a plastic tube running the length of the napalm strike to be filled with petrol and detonated with the same rippling effect that napalm has. Now, Ray, what we've got to do is tape this on very securely because otherwise it's liable to break loose and start leaking before we fire the shot. Yeah. Gary always rehearses new effects well in advance. It's much cheaper to spend a day quietly ironing out any problems than to keep an entire film crew hanging around at a cost of close to $5,000 an hour. It took 20 gallons of petrol to fill the tube prior to arming the charges. All right, we're wiring up now. You can all stand clear, please. It was a successful blast. Not quite enough ripple in the flame, but Gary's working on it. Like other specialist danger freaks, he's a perfectionist. Recently, he laid charges on an 18-story building and didn't leave a mark. Look into the innocent eyes of this angelic child. Who would ever have guessed that 36 years later, the same delicate baby would be clambering over some of the world's more famous monuments, risking his life for that strange combination of glamour and quick profit, unique to the movie business. On his 36th birthday, Grant happened to be in London. Born under the sign of Leo, he chose an appropriate location for his daily press-ups. Behind a facade of good-humoured exhibitionism, there lurks one of life's eternal challenges. Athletes receive accolades for their record-breaking achievements, but a stuntman's triumphs are often critically dismissed as unworthy of serious attention. Even though his specialist techniques might have cost him years of thought, experience, and perhaps injury. 
In three quarters of a century of movie making, only two serious books have emerged analyzing the stuntman's role in the growth of the multi-billion dollar dream factory. If Grant ever wins any medals, it will be for his work with heights. He has made it his fearless speciality. His inspiration apparently stemmed in childhood from seeing vintage newsreels of the early daredevils. After World War I, balloon stunts were particularly popular. Showmen bought them from government surplus for $100, and the stuntmen performed their feats often for less than half that amount. Mr. Roy Apt, an off-duty policeman, endeavoured to earn a few extra dollars by taking a bath a thousand feet above Fifth and Figueroa Streets, Los Angeles. Commentators dismissed this extraordinary stunt with wisecracks about the cop who came clean. One of the youngest daredevils must have been 10-year-old Mildred Unger. Her father had mounted a balloon stunt to entertain a Shriners convention. The actress he had hired to dance on top of the balloon backed out at the last moment, so Mildred took over and performed the Charleston 2,000 feet above the city. She received a lot of publicity for her courage, but little money. Her fee was $50. At Lake Merritt, California, these men are preparing for the world's first five-man bailout from a balloon. Their first attempt to at take off was nearly a disaster, but miraculously, no one was hurt. The next day, they tried again with revised equipment. To keep spectators gasping during the ascent, they perform gymnastics prior to bailing out at a safe height, five men from the same balloon. To our knowledge, this record has not yet been broken. Parachutes have been a source of fascination to Grant Page since his days in the commandos. Skydiving soon led to paragliding. This requires the parachutist to be towed along a horizontal plane parallel to the ground, but with his chute in the position it adopts when descending vertically. This is an equally hazardous method of riding the air as hang gliding, and the same problems apply. If the angle of glide becomes too extreme, the leading edge of the chute will fold in, spilling out the air, causing the rider to drop like a stone to the ground. A careful paraglider controls his progress via prearranged leg signals to the driver of the tow vehicle. Grant feels that the commandos who taught him paragliding were also responsible for the bulk of his professional discipline. In your army training, you, you, you're very repetitive in everything you do. You know, it's preordained. What, what's going to happen is going to happen because you've done it so many times before, and you do the same with stunt work. On a wintry Adelaide beach, Grant's countless hours in the air enabled him to paraglide under conditions few would have shared. You've worked yourself into a state of mind that there's no, no surprises in it. It just happens as, as you've worked it out yourself. He had calculated that with the winds as they were, there would be 2,500 pounds of strain on the chute. And that's only 500 pounds less than the known breaking point and easily achieved. There's no emotion involved at all. There would be if something started to go wrong, if something unpredictable did come in or something you hadn't predicted started to come in. Then, then you start to get a bit emotionally involved, like... <laughs> Once underway, only concentration and experience would detect an increase. It's, a, it's an eerie sensation because you can hear the rigging lines creaking and you can just about feel the stress. It's like sort of being on a violin bow and you're just waiting for something to happen. The whole thing's a rigid unit that will take the total force of whatever gust of wind comes along. The only way it can relax from that force is for something to break. And that's the one thing you don't want to happen. 
parachute has been a great source of challenge to stuntmen since the early 1900s. Daredevil Joe Campy's speciality was to be strapped into a straitjacket. He was then inserted into a cylinder beneath a plane with a parachute tied to his feet. Somehow, either by skilled escapology or just plain cheating, he always made it down safely. This man, George Delaney by name, wasn't so lucky. He attempted to set a world record by making a jump from 10 consecutive parachutes before hitting the ground. After an alarming false start, the hot air balloon finally got him airborne. When the balloon started to deflate, he opened his first parachute, but his erratic takeoff probably cost him more height than he imagined. As the remains of the balloon reached the ground, Delaney was not far behind. He pulled the ripcord on his tenth chute too late for it to inflate, and the result was fatal. Grant Page has always had a soft spot for animals, and stunting with animals is a specialized field in which he would like to enlarge his experience. In the last episode of Danger Freaks, we saw Grant's first wrestling match with a fully grown leopard. Under the supervision of the leopard's trainer, he went into its cage to learn more about how such scenes should be handled. Grant remarked later that working with a leopard sent adrenaline pumping through his veins like no other stunt he's done. The whole point of it is that you've got to make it look like a fight, but make it feel like play to the leopard. Grant feels that a charge of adrenaline actually increases his physical and mental powers. Adrenaline is, in its effect, very like speed. Um, it gets you going. It, it really sort of gets you keyed up. It cuts down all of the, the unnecessary action, the actions of the body, unnecessary for violent, sudden action, and dilates all of the blood vessels to the areas where you really need them. So it's the muscles, the brain, the heart, areas like this. You usually find that uh, sort of anything to do with digestion or anything like that just doesn't work when you're in, in a keyed up state. I, I, I always say that I, I don't um, have any emotional fear. Um, I, don't want, I don't want to translate it as I don't appreciate the danger. I do. And that's what gives me the adrenaline hit. It's the full awareness of just how dangerous what I'm doing is. That gets me keyed up. That gets me going. Here, when the leopard sank its claws into his bicep, his instinct was to push it away. But his heightened insight held him steady while the trainer gently extracted the animal. Gradually, over three hours, Grant's confidence grew. He has a long way to go before he matches the ability of trainer Jack Seal, who has been building a relationship with this leopard every day for the past seven months. Their personal understanding has reached the stage where the leopard will occasionally lie on her back, exposing her vulnerable throat and stomach to indicate her submission to the dominance of man. Jack then reciprocates. However, a leopard is one of the few predators that kills for pleasure, and only an expert could handle the animal as roughly as this. Here is some rare footage of Mel Kuntz rehearsing a fight with one of his big cats. In his day, he was the greatest trainer of wild animals for movies in Hollywood. At the Thousand Oaks World Jungle Compound, 32 miles north of the city, Mel handled a wide variety of animals from their earliest days in captivity. After a period of assessment, each would be reserved for movie work, circus acts, or sent to a zoo. Teaching ball games to an orangutan is, in its way, just as difficult as training the big cats, 
but the thrill-seeking public attending the Jungle Compound's daily shows would always prefer to watch Mel face a black panther bearing its two-inch claws. Mel's lions were rationed to 12 pounds of meat a day, but they were always ready for more. This hungry fellow gave one of the camera team the fright of his life. But like a true danger freak, he kept the camera rolling all the way down. Mel's favorite cat was a tiger named Satan. He was quite a famous tiger too. And unlike most movie stars, he was thoroughly disinterested in his own publicity shots. He just wanted another friendly wrestle with Mel. You would have seen him performing in countless action pictures of the 50s and early 60s, from jungle movies to gladiatorial epics. Finally, Satan got the tussle he was asking for. To Mel, this daily routine was just like exercising the dog, or rather the cat. He had raised Satan since he was a cub, and by this stage of their relationship, there was little danger that things would get out of hand, but he always kept a firm grip on the leash at all times, just in case. Grant Page is not quite ready for tigers yet, but before he left Africa, he extended his animal repertoire by getting to know the characteristics of a recently captured long-haired hyena. It's a hunting hyena, and it brings down its game at the gallop, usually antelope or something like that. Capable of 45 miles an hour, the hyena has jaws stronger than its two regular competitors for prey. On the right, the leopard. On the left, the baboon. In one bite, it can crack the femur of a horse. That's a bone one and a half inches in diameter. It has a, a double jointed front leg that hooks the leg of the, the animal it's, it's chasing, and then with one snap, it breaks the leg. Because this is great when the thing's got my hand in its mouth and sort of wielding it around. I was, you know, I was terrified it was going to get the hiccups. <laughs> Next, Grant examined the fangs of the deadly Egyptian cobra. He felt it was the easiest of the animals he had handled so far. The difference between a snake and a leopard is that a leopard is cunning, a snake is predictable. You know exactly what the snake's going to do. In fact, you can make the snake do what you want it to do because it reacts to stimulus very, very predictably. And you, you keep it angry and keep it attracted by moving your hand because it's attracted to movement. And then by moving a little bit harder or a little bit faster, a bit more aggressively, it'll then strike. And you can predict at what moment it's going to strike and you just move your hand over the road. It's quite easy. Grant Page is at it again, conducting an unauthorized expedition into the rigging of the Cutty Sark. What makes a man continually expose himself to danger? Long way back in history, when we were in the trees, we had to climb in trees. Well, now, for some reason or another, it gives us pleasure to expose ourselves to the danger of climbing in trees. Subsequently, the authorities went to some trouble to remind Grant that the Cutty Sark, although made of wood, should not be considered a tree. People expose themselves to danger from all sorts of different reasons. For instance, there's another reason too. Uh, you're familiar with the idea of masochism, aren't you? So that people expose themselves to pain and kind of get fun out of it or pleasure out of it. Well, in another way, people expose themselves to danger so as to experience anxiety in a kind of perverted way, in a way, so that there's a thrill about it. When we go to a film and experience the, the thrill of it, the unpleasant anxiety, and like it. And of course, there's still another way too. Uh, sometimes people, do something dangerous so as to catalyze their anxiety so that afterwards they feel more at ease. Grant's personal philosophy of challenge is best reflected in his recounting of a rope slide accident that happened at this same cliff 10 years ago. One of the guys in free fall who was doing about 40 miles an hour 
Uh, he just caught his caught his feet on a ledge. Well, at 40 miles an hour, um, he broke both legs in about three places. And uh, we weren't we weren't too sure what was actually wrong with him. But we we knew he was badly hurt, and we didn't have time to, to get anyone down here to help him. So the only thing I could do was I had to time on the back and climb up here. This is the spot I climbed up. The the big thing about it was the motivation to do it. If that guy hadn't been screaming screaming in agony as he was, and that was right in my ear because he was across my back with both of his broken legs hanging out. I'm trying to leave his body hanging out from me, but even then, every now and then, a, a foot or a knee had bounced against, against a bit of rock, and his mouth was right in my ear and he was screaming, and that sort of kept me going. I don't think I could have made 300 feet up a good face with somebody on the back otherwise. I know, when I got to the top, I was on all fours and I couldn't move. It, it just shows you that everyone has these huge potentials physically that they're, they're, they never tap until they're in a total stress situation. And they talk about the, the strength of the insane. Well, it's the same thing. In a moment of stress, you can exert some terrific strength that normally you, you, you just couldn't exert. But Grant is forever seeking out or creating adrenaline charging total stress situations for himself. Does he perhaps have an adrenaline addiction? It, it's possible. I mean, everything is either uh, addictable or habit-forming in some way. If it's not a physiological addiction, it's a, a psychological addiction. And um, perhaps I just like being excited. I might like the feeling of being keyed up. <laughs> Don't you even think of ever trying any of the stunts that they perform? They're the experts.